Chapter 3 is entitled Population, uh, Economic Growth, Population Growth, and the Environment. And the first subsection is entitled Are There Limits to Growth? Which harkens back to the book entitled Limits to Growth that we discussed in a previous chapter. First I want to comment on a distinction that is uncommonly made, but, but it is made by Herman Daly, between economic growth and economic development. In Daly's terminology, economic growth is a change in the, si in the physical size of the economy. So in the physical amounts of natural resources that the economy takes out of the ecosystem or an increase in the amount of pollutants that the e economy puts into the ecosystem. Whereas economic development is a qualitative change, a qualitative improvement in what the economy does let's say producing better machines, higher quality smartphones, in a way that may not involve economic growth. So it may not involve taking more resources from the environment or creating more pollution. As I said, this is not a standard distinction. So the vast majority of economists use economic growth and economic development as synonyms, but I think it's a useful distinction to keep in mind. Now, one can ask if economic growth or economic development is occurring, where is it occurring? And one of the reasons that's an interesting question is because there's a wide variety of income levels among different countries of the world. Box 3.1 discusses that. Here, I use some updated figures from the year 2005 to show what's called a north-south divide. The richest countries in the world are often located in the quote-unquote global north, in North America, the USA and Canada, uh, Europe, and poorer countries are often located in what's called the global south, Latin America, Africa. Now these distinctions can't be taken too literally. Australia, for example, is extremely far south and yet it's a rich country. Still, to illustrate the north-south divide here, I've got 2005 per capita GDP numbers, first for the richest countries. You see Luxembourg, Norway, Switzerland, Denmark, Iceland, and the USA with per capita incomes between forty-three and $65,000. And then the poorest countries, Ethiopia, Somalia, Liberia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Burundi, with per capita incomes between $156 and $96. So that's per person per year. So certainly, uh, just as the book illustrated when, when the book was written, there's a wide variety of income levels across the world. Now how about this question of, are there limits to growth? The book discusses reasons for optimism and reasons for pessimism. Now, I don't think the, the people who would be classified as optimists think of themselves as optimists. I think they think of themselves as realists. And the same is true of the people who are classified here as pessimists. They think of themselves as being realist, realistic, not as being pessimistic. But I, I think it, these are useful terms anyway as a shorthand for people who, on the one hand, the optimists, think that economic growth is highly likely to continue for a long time and won't be difficult, and pessimists for people who think that economic growth may not continue for a long time, may be very difficult to achieve. So let's talk about here these reasons for optimism. Box 3.2 discusses decoupling growth and resource use. To decouple means that you could have growth going in one direction, let's say up, and resource use going another direction, let's say down. And Box 3.2 illustrates the large decrease in the energy intensity of GDP that has come about since the first oil shock of the early 1970s. In other words, GDP has been going up, but the, the resource intensity of GDP, so the amount of, let's say, barrels of oil needed to produce one dollar of GDP has been shrinking since then. So this is an example of decoupling 
and decoupling is good because it means that resource use could fall while growth w uh, would go up. Uh, next reason for optimism, resource discoveries, illustrated in box 3.3. .3, people are finding new discoveries of exhaustible resources all the time. Um, another sort of resource discovery, I suppose, would be technological change that increases the way we can use uh, materials, uh, or changes the way we can use materials so that they're more useful to us. Another reason for optimism, pollution and control measures. We've learned how to control pollution in lots of different ways. So the, this is scientific progress that enables us to pollute less than we did before. And also techniques of recycling. The next point, market signals for conservation and substitution. So this is referring to the way the free market works. So there's no government interference in, in that's being discussed in this point. When a resource gets scarce, think about an exhaustible resource becoming scarce, the price goes up because the supply curve shifts back. And this price goes up gives a signal to consumers that they should buy less of the material. So the quantity demanded falls. And so you sort of get an automatic conservation, automatic decrease in quantity demanded because the scarcity has caused price to increase. The in increase in price also encourages people to try to find substitutes for the commodity that has become more expensive. This, you'll recall, is the mechanism, the market mechanism, that's totally lacking in the Limits to Growth book. And that's the reason why economists heavily criticize the Limits to Growth book. In Limits to Growth, even as a resource was becoming more scarce, the quantity used increased as an, at an exponential rate. But an economist would say that as a resource became scarce, the, the market price would go up, and so quantity demanded for the resource would fall, not rise. And the last example here for optimism is that population growth is slowing. There's some countries in the world now where population growth is essentially zero, even slightly negative. Uh, Italy would be one example, South Korea would be another example, Japan would be another example. So those are the those are the reasons for optimism. How about the reasons for pessimism? George S. U. Rogan warned about what he called linear thinking, by which he meant relatively mindless extrapolation of the past into the future. If you engage in linear thinking, you'll say things like, well, the US economy was growing 100 years ago, and 200 years ago, and 300 years ago, and even, I suppose, 400 years ago, and so it'll grow forever. In, in other words, you look at the recent past, which might be the last few years or the last few centuries, and then assume that that pattern is going to continue forever. And Jujescu said that's not necessarily the case. There's a He used an analogy. Let me flip to that screen now. So the analogy here from uh, Wikipedia, it's a French folk song, the Song of La Police. Let me read the English translation here. I'm going to change the wording a little bit to be a bit closer to the way that Georgescu translated. Uh, Sur de la police is dead. He died at the Battle of Pavia. A quarter of an hour before his death, he was still alive. Now, in France, this is just, this and, and the, the variants of this song are just meant to humor, humorously illustrate things that are obvious. But Georgescu had a serious point, which is that, so a quarter of an hour before somebody died, how would you predict that this person was going to die? Suppose somebody's been living for 60 years. Well, if you look a year back, two years back, three years back, 10 years back, 20 years back, 30 years back, 40 years back, they've been alive all those times. So if you just extrapolate from the past, you, you'll conclude that they're going to live forever. Well, of course, that's not true. And so uh, he showed, this is an example to show the perils of linear thinking, the perils of simplistically extrapolating from the past to the future. 
you don't want to do that. Jojiski thought that the last 500 years have been a unique period he calls the mineralogical bonanza. That before then economies really didn't show a didn't show a pattern of growing over time. Georgescu says that the last 500 years have been an exception because humans have learned how to use exhaustible resources. And so they're using exhaustible resources, but then the exhaustible resources are going to run out, and then Georgescu thinks it's quite likely that we go back to the pattern it used to be that economies really didn't grow. In the same kind of way as uh, Suppose there's a cake that's been locked in a refrigerator for millennia, and then you learn how to open the refrigerator. Well, then you can spend 500 years eating this cake, but you shouldn't predict that you can eat the cake forever. The cake's a finite size. At some point, the, you will have eaten all the cake, and then you go back to the situation before you didn't have any, bef before you started eating the cake in the first place, because there's no cake left anymore. And so that shows the the perils of just looking at what's happened in the recent past, which might be the last few centuries, and assuming that the future is going to be just like the past. So those are the perils of linear thinking. Let's go point by point through these different items under pessimism. Doubts about the ability to decouple growth and resource use. Um, yes, it's nice that at some points in the past we've been able to decrease resource use and increase economic growth, but is that always going to be possible? Georgescu said that the assumption that this is always going to be possible, that you'll be able to have an infinitely growing economy without using many resources at all, ignores the distinction, as he puts it, between the Earth and the Garden of Eden. And of course, you shouldn't ignore such dis such distinctions. So this is criticizing economists who say that that decoupling is going to be easy and it's going to last forever. It's very interesting that neoclassical economists have such an optimistic view of economic growth because in other contexts, neoclassical economists very often criticize other social scientists for not taking constraints and limits into account. It's the economist that reminds everybody there's no such thing as a free lunch. But in the context of economic growth, actually, neoclassical economists often don't pay a lot of attention to constraints and limits and the lack of free lunches. Georgescu here is, is, is criticizing them for that and is reminding them that it may actually not be possible to, to decouple growth and resource use very much. And then, of course, you you have you can't grow if you have these kind of limits. Uh, next point: doubts about resource discoveries. Well, yes, maybe we can find more exhaustible resources, but maybe we won't, or maybe those deposits will be too small or too expensive to extract. Doubts about pollution control measures. Anybody who has studied global warming, as we have certainly will have some doubts about whether we're going to be able and willing to adopt the kind of control, pollution control measures we need in order to combat global warming. Um, how about doubts about recycling? This is also, recycling has become quite problematic in the last couple of years. As recently as 2018, the, the U.S. and other countries, rich countries like the U.S., sent a lot of their goods to be recycled to China. But then China decided not to import such re recycling uh, materials anymore and it's been hard to find other countries that are willing to import stuff to be recycled and therefore recycling has become much more difficult in the US and also much more costly just since just between 2018 and 2020 uh, and finally doubts about whether population growth will slow enough and that is a nice segue into the next section here on population growth, which is going to be our next video.